shattered and grieve. See the devil wanna scatter and deceive. And God's no love, he'll leave you battered to bleed. Every day getting sadder, we need the love of Jesus Christ instead of another platter of weed. I pray the Lord has mercy on my soul. Sometimes I find me climbing up the ladder of greed. Trying to get my screw right, but the Lord said I'm here. This is Rayford Johnson with uh, thugexposed.org and today uh, we got former NBA star LaSalle Thompson, formerly with the Sacramento Kings. Uh, LaSalle, I appreciate you coming out and uh, talking with our audience, talking with the youth. Um, first question I want to ask you, we just want to get right to it. Uh, if you could take us on that journey from childhood to being an NBA star. And you know, tell us a little bit about what your childhood was like. Oh, well, first, thanks for having me here, Ray. So, all right, now, um, I, I was born and raised in Cincinnati, and um, just growing up, you know, I was just a typical kid. Um, I was always tall, but I was always really thin, and um, I didn't start playing basketball till I was 13, 14 years old. Actually, I went out for the team when I was 13 and got cut, and then I made it when I was 14. And, um, I, and one of the things we talked about the last time we talked, I told you how I came to play basketball. And um, when I was a kid, um, you know, I won't say I was really bad, I was just wild. And I used to do things like you know, steal, and get some skipping school. Uh, we used to hop the train to school and things like that. But um, yeah, I never did the things, like I never got high. Um, but I, as a teenager, I did do some drinking. Right. Where, now, so, where'd you grow up at? I grew up in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. And um, I just, you know, pretty much a typical middle class neighborhood. Um, through elementary school, when I went to elementary school, um, I didn't know it at the time, but um, up until I was seven, we lived in the projects. And mm -hmm. then uh, my mother and my stepfather, they moved us to a, um, just a, it was a regular house in a regular you know, neighborhood. I thought we'd move to the country because I never had a lawn. I'd never seen that much green grass and <laughs> fields and stuff before. And it was just a regular neighborhood. But when I went to elementary school in second grade, uh, this would have been like about 67, 68. It was the first year um, that, that black students were allowed to go to the school I went to. So. Um, all the way through elementary school, there was always only one or two black kids in my class. Mm. And of course, I didn't know much difference between that. Right. I can think back about things that happen now and realize that uh, it was different and there were some things that happened that as a kid, you know, kids, a lot of times, they don't understand racist things and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, no, it's different situations like that. Right. Did, so did, that, did that impact you in far as the, well, it didn't impact did you have me kind of racist uh, uh, beliefs uh, from well, those experiences? No, I, I, uh, it's just when I think back about it now as an adult, when I became, say, 20, 25, and I thought back to when I was 7, 8, there were things that happened that um, you know, weren't real kosher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, you know, when you're Anything seven, you care to old, share? Anything you care um, to share? Like an experience? That yeah. Uh, I, I, well, when I was in the fourth grade, there was a girl who used to sit at the desk in front of me. We had those desks that were kind of slanted with the lift-up lid, you know. And there was a girl that sat in front of me named Jenny, and uh, I don't remember her last name now, so many years ago, but she was white. Mm -hmm. And we had just come in from lunch, and it was our afternoon class, and she had this long ponytail. And, or she had this long hair, but that particular day she had a little ponytail. And I said, Jenny, can I play with your ponytail? And she said, yeah. And I didn't you know, right. I didn't have a crush on anything. We were just right. playing. We were kids. And I was playing with her ponytail. And the teacher snuck up behind me with this yardstick. And she slammed it on the desk <laughs> right, you know, right next to me. And I almost jumped out of my skin. Scared me. <laughs> and she said, you get your filthy hands out of her hair. Wow. And I wouldn't, I didn't, you know, as a kid, right. I, all I was thinking was, you know, we just had lunch. I just washed my hands right, right. before we came to class. I'm thinking, my hands are clean. My hands right. aren't filthy. But so you know, right now, I know that's not what that. she meant. Right. You know, she meant as a black kid touching this white kid. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times kids don't have that racism in them. Yeah. And uh, it has to be taught to them. We hadn't been taught any of that stuff yet. Right. So. So what, what was the household like? I mean, like, say, your mom, um, your dad, tell us a little bit about that. My mother and my they... stepfather both worked. My grandmother lived with us, and uh, my grandmother, you know, always cooked the meals in the evening. Mm -hmm. I had a, an uncle that lived with us, 
and uh, he was heavy into the church, mm -hmm. and uh, he went to church every week. I didn't. Right. <laughs> And did your mom and dad go to church? Did your mom and dad go to church? My mother didn't go. My grandmother went, and right. my I, my uncle, you know, he was a deacon in the church, so oh, he, okay. was, he was heavy into the church. Right. And uh, and I shared a room with my uncle, but uh, you know, he uh, we had a big family. There were 11 kids in my, on my mother's side of the family, seven on my father's side, and um, our family is, we're very family oriented. Mm -hmm. Our family was real close. Uh, you know, at family reunions every year, Sundays, every Sunday cookouts at the house. and yeah. stuff like that. Sunday cookouts, like holiday food. cookouts, yeah. yeah. Right. And you know, my grandmother used to throw down. So, <laughs> you know, it was okay. like that. And so, um, you know, that was the environment I grew up in. And Cincinnati is a typical Midwestern city. Now, now that I'm an adult and I'm away from Cincinnati, I'd have to say Cincinnati is one of the more, more racist places I've been in my life. I didn't mm. know it then because I right. hadn't ever been anywhere else. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I experienced as a kid, I didn't. I didn't know any different from it. And, um, but the way I started playing basketball, when um, I was in the uh, eighth grade, um, the high school that I eventually went to when I went to senior high school, they were building a vocational school. And my high school was only about four blocks from my house. Mm -hmm. And um, they had a construction site over there. And you know, the construction site, when you're 13, 14 years old, you're going to be over there doing something. Right, right. And right. so we were over there playing around. Playing around. Um, you know, it, I mean, now you, you know, when I think about it now, we were over there vandalizing because we were, you know, <laughs> taking tiles and slinging them mm -hmm. and climbing up on stuff and, you know, just kids being rambunctious. And this guy came over, and he was a cop, but, and he lived right next door to the high school, you know, like two doors away. And I guess uh, there had been some stuff going on over there. And he told me all this later. This is years later I found all this out, but he had been kind of watching over there to make sure nobody was over there doing anything. So when he saw us, he came and he said, what are you guys doing over here? And you know, we were just playing around and stuff. And he said, no, you guys can't be playing over here. You, you know, you get hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked us how we were. And at the time, I was 13. I was uh, 6'3". Wow. And so he said, uh, I was always real tall. And now how me, tall are you now? I'm 6'9 now. 6'9, okay. And he asked me, do you play basketball? And I said, no. And so he took me and my friends, he took us to his garage, and I remember he opened his garage door, and he had about 20 basketballs mm. on the uh, ground. And this guy had three kids, three sons, and they all played basketball. And so he gave us a basketball, he gave each of us a basketball, and he said, you know, you need to start taking this basketball and playing with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would go, there was a, in the parking lot, there was a basketball goal. And this was in the summertime when we would go out there and play every day. And you know, in Cincinnati, it gets hot right. and humid in the summer. But we would, we would go out there about 5 or 6 in the evening and we would play till 11, 12 o'clock at night. And so what happened, the guys in my neighborhood, the guys that used to come sit in the park and drink 40s every night, mm -hmm. they, they all got together and said, told me I was getting too big not to play. So they said, we're going to teach you to play. <laughs> and you know, we were just out there playing right. pickup games of street ball. Now I think like, they really didn't know how to play. Right. But they were better than me because I didn't play at all. So um, I started, I just started playing every day. And then that fall I went out for the team and I got cut. Mm -hmm. And um, so what did that do to you when you got cut? Um, I, you know, now that I, when I think back about it, it was no big deal. I wanted to play. I wanted to play, but I wasn't, you know, Basketball hadn't become that important. Anymore. Right, right. Um, it was just something to do. Mm -hmm. And so when I got cut, I, you know, oh well, mm -hmm. kept it going. So, um, but I continued to play. And the next year, when it came back around again, I went out for the team again. I still wasn't that good. I was six five now. I'm in right. the ninth grade, and I still wasn't that good. But I think the coach put me on the team because I was the tallest kid in school. He figured right. I right. might be able to teach him something. So um, that was the the beginning of my plan and. So I started playing in the ninth grade. I got cut in eighth grade. I made the team in the ninth grade. We won one game, mm -hmm. and that's how bad we were. We won one game. Uh -huh. And then in the 10th grade, um, we only won three games when I was in the 10th grade, but I made all city. Mm -hmm. The next year, you know, we won, we lost maybe two games, and so I made who, all who, state. who really helped you develop that talent? Um, you know? Just my coach, like my high school coach, my junior high coach was just a guy, but you see a lot of guys like this, he liked basketball as a coach, but he didn't really know a lot right. about it. My high school coach, had uh, he had some experience, and he was, um, you know, he, he, he tells a story now and says, 
I was just a, a tireless worker mm -hmm. that worked so hard, but I didn't know any better. Good so work he he had a good work ethic. I had a great work ethic. Right. Work ethic. But he would just tell me to do stuff and I'd do it. And I didn't know, you know at mm -hmm. some point you get tired. And I was so long and skinny. Right. You know, I had so much energy and I just, you know, I, I, I worked everybody and mm -hmm. I did everything he told me to do. Um, and he just helped develop a lot of fundamentals within me. I, you know, I knew how to you know, run and jump and all that, but he developed ball handling and shooting and, you know, just taught me. He right. taught me how to play. Now, who was your role model in the NBA at the time? Um, at the time, the, the guy that I looked, well, at that time, I, I, you know, when I was in junior high and high school, I didn't think I was going to make it to the NBA. Mm -hmm. And so my, my role model, there was a guy named Louis Orr who played in the NBA, but he went to the same high school as me. He's a coach at Bowling Green University now. He was my idol on a guy named Herb Williams, who's a coach for the New York Knicks now, he's assistant, but Herb was the All-American from Ohio, and, and those were my two idols. Now, when I got to, say, my senior year of high school and I got to college, my, my idol was Moses Malone. Okay. But, um, you know, a lot of those guys I looked up to, and, it, you know, I didn't know in you know, three mm -hmm. years I got to play with them. But, right. um, you know, I started playing, the second year I was playing, I made All-City. The next year I made All-State. The next year I made All-American. Three years after that, I was in the NBA. Mm. And so mm. I, you know, my game, I developed very quickly. And um, I was, by my senior year of high school, I was 6'9". I've been 6'9 since I was 17. I thought I was going to be a 7-footer, <laughs> but I never grew again right. after I turned 17. I filled out more, but I was 6'9". I, was I weighed about 220 pounds. Right. So I was really thin. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to college at the University of Texas. Um, I went there because when I went to visit, it was hot. Mm -hmm. And I love hot weather. So yeah. I said, okay, I knew I would play there. And so that was the school I chose. So who instilled that discipline in you to get the grades to, to be able to go to a um, university? Because you said that you just followed yeah, well, everything your coach did. A lot yeah, of my coach stayed on me about my grades. Yeah. And, and I've kind of always been a bit of a nerd. Mm -hmm. I've always been in the gadgets and scientific stuff. And I, I always read a lot. I think that's probably, I think the biggest plus to my education is I read a lot. Not you know, as a kid, I read comic books, and then when I got an old enough to read books, right. I started reading books. I remember I would, I would check books out of the library five or ten at a time. And mm. I remember one time I was checking out ten books, and the lady said, "So what are you gonna do with those books?" And you know, kids don't. There's a lot of things <laughs> right. we don't. I was like, well, "I'm gonna right. read them." That's unusual. And the lady wouldn't let me. She wouldn't let me take ten books, and she said I wasn't gonna read them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, I read ten books every week, mm. and so. She would only let me have like three. Did your mom make you read? Mom and dad no, make you just, read? I just, you just, you know, I read all stuff you like, just had like you know, all the books that kids read. Right. You know, I just read. Right. I like to read. And so um, the lady would only let me have three books. Well, I was back to the library the, two days later because I was done with the books. <laughs> I took. Okay. And you know, I was mad because now I got to go back to the library again when I only, I'm used to going once a week. So, right. Um, but I think that was the biggest plus for me was I read a lot. And it right. doesn't, I think, um, if you're not if you're not a person that reads a lot or you're not a good reader, there's something that interests you. You can find uh, books or something to read about that. Right. And um, and so I encourage, I always encourage kids and people to read mm -hmm. because uh, it opens up a whole new world to you. There's a lot of things you can educate yourself on just mm -hmm. by reading. And now with the way the internet is, I mean, I spend probably five or six hours a day on the internet and I read about everything. Mm. You know, we might talk about something here and I'll go home and look it up right. and read about it. Um, somebody might say I have some sickness, I'll go look it up and read up on it and see what's wrong with them. Yeah, thirst for knowledge. I have a very huge thirst for knowledge. Okay, and, I, and, and that just came yeah. naturally as a youth. Just being um, uh, yeah, just, curious yeah, about things. I was a very curious kid. <laughs> okay. Yeah, That's a I good was. Habit. Now you said you met, like I said, you, you weren't really drawn to the drugs like a lot of uh, youth yeah, are in I mean, high you know, school. Growing up, and I, I remember, I remember all my friends would you know, smoke weed and get high and stuff. I remember in junior high, I knew a guy in junior high who, you know, who took heroin. Mm. And these, I there's a lot of drug activity going on in your area. Yeah. Cincinnati is um, pretty, yeah, pretty just, tough area. I just never. Uh, it wasn't as tough then, but I just. It was just something I just never did. I never felt an urge to, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no. I can't say that there was some thing that happened or mm -hmm. some event. It's just something I didn't gravitate toward. Right. Um, you know, when I was in junior high, I did a little bit of drinking, and then when I started playing basketball, I, I quit doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But I was just I was never a good high kind of guy. So we're in our college days. I mean, like you say, you're away from home. Yeah. 
You know, uh, like I said, you know, a lot well, of people uh, have, have those well, beliefs that when kids go off to I'm college. I'm something else about me now. When I think about <laughs> now, you couldn't have told me this when I was 17, 18, 19. I was a nerd and I was very um, inexperienced and very naive about a lot of things. Right. Of course, at the time, I thought I was the man that knew everything. Yeah. You know, right, like most right. 17, 18 year olds, you know, you think you know everything, you don't. And so, um, but at, at college, um, I didn't, uh, you know, I think my in the three years I was in college, I maybe got drunk three times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, every now and then you drink some beer or something, but I just, that was just never my scene. Yeah. Um, and luckily, the, you know, the guys I hung with, the teammates I hung with, they weren't like that either. We go out and we go out to the club and have a good. And that, at that time, when I went to college, the drinking age in Texas was only 18. Mm. So I was old enough to drink, but right. um, we didn't we didn't do a lot of drinking. We go out and party and hang out and stuff. Right. But you know, I think it was chasing women more yeah. than it was any type of getting high. Right. So so now you get drafted into the NBA. Now how yeah. was that? How was that experience to get drafted into the NBA? Well, you know, like, um, like you said, you said only you know from Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I always, I always give kids hand an how many people like got drafted. Yeah, yeah. I, I give kids I, like here in Sacramento. I want to talk to a group of kids, and I said, and all of them say, you know, they want to play pro ball. Well, you know, everybody wants to do it, but a lot of people don't want to put in the work to do it. Right. And I said, let me ask y'all a question. I said, all y'all think y'all gonna make it to the NBA? I said, how many people from Sacramento do you know that made it to the NBA? And they started thinking, they said, you know, Kevin Johnson, um, there's a kid that plays in Orlando whose name escapes me right now, but there's um, Bill, uh, what's the kid who went to El who's from El Grove? Played oh, for the Bulls. Oh, Bill Russell? No, no, not, not Bill, Bill Russell. Russell. Uh, uh, and I might be at his first name. Uh, um, the guy from, from uh, oh, Bill Cartwright. Bill Cartwright. Right. There's probably, and that's we're that talking about the last back. 20 years, yeah, that's wild. 20, 30 back. years, there's maybe five guys from Sacramento right. that made it. So, you know, I tell kids it's very difficult, and I said, you look around you, every kid in this city, there might be one kid right. that makes it to the NBA. You know, you might have three guys that make it to the NFL. Mm -hmm. I said, but um, sports can get you a free education. The college is really expensive. It can get you a free education, and because you play ball, it'll get you some good connections for a job. Mm -hmm. And that's how I try to tell kids to look at it. I said, if you end up making it to a pro league, um, a good part of it is luck. Because for every guy like me that played in the league, there's probably 10 guys that were as good as me that something happened mm -hmm. and they didn't get, they didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, unless you're really good, like LeBron, D-Wade, somebody like that, those guys are probably gonna make it to the league. But, so a lot of guys, a lot of it is luck, a lot of it is circumstance, a lot of it is being with the right team or having the right coach, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And a lot of it is your parents and you're right. coming up in the right household, being around the right people. So what, what are some of the things you feel that your parents did right for um, you to, to keep you, you know, on my that mother, track? Well, you know, my mother was strict and so my mother wasn't, you know, you know, I grew up in a black household, so yeah. we got hit. So my mother wasn't afraid to punish me. And I, I think the last time my mother, she didn't whoop me, but the yeah. last time my mother hit me, it beat yeah. me. I was 15. Right. I was six, seven. Right. And I think she just decided that I was getting too big. Right. And then she would just, she would yell at me and stuff, and she would just punish me anytime I did something mm -hmm. wrong. Um, you know, my mother, you know, made us go to school, but you know, she she worked and had food on the table for us. And you know, my grandmother was at the house all the time, yeah. so you wasn't sneaking and getting away. There was a lot of structure in the house. Yeah, we had, yeah, we had a, we had a good family structure. Yeah, you right. wasn't getting away with stuff. Right. Um, and so, uh, but we had, we had, you know, my uncle was there. He'd say on me about stuff. So we just we had a good family structure. And then, you know, I had a good extended family. Yeah. Um, you know, the people around my neighborhood, they kept an eye on things. Mm -hmm. You know, they always say it takes a village to raise a kid. Yeah. If I was True. down the street doing something, my mother would know about it. And some accountability. So yeah, there was a lot, a lot of, of accountability. Yeah, a lot of accountability going on. Yeah. So you get chosen for the NBA, and, and that, I mean, what was that like? I mean, well, that they, you got drafted yeah, I, actually, the NBA. I started talking about something else. So, yeah, no, that's all right. I, I want to hear. Um, like what happened, um, I knew in my junior year of college I could, I could go pro, but I hadn't decided whether I wanted to go. And me and my coach sat down and talked about it, and he said, you would be a top 10 pick right now, but you need, you need another year of college. And so I was leaning toward coming back to school. And then it was about two days after we had this conversation, they fired the coach. Really? And so um, 
I didn't like the new guy they brought in. I mean, he's an okay guy, but I didn't want to play for him. And so I decided you know, I was going to go pro. And at that time, you didn't have guys coming out of high school going to the league. So even though I'd been three years of college, I was the second youngest guy in the NBA my rookie year. Wow. I was 21. Okay. And uh, a guy named Clark Kellogg, he right. was three months younger than me. We were two youngest guys in the league. We were both. Uh, we played against each other in high school. He's a really good player. But, um, you know, I came out and I got drafted by the Kings number five. Now, see, when I came out, guys didn't make millions of dollars like they do, do now. Right. I was a number five pick in the draft. I made 175000 my first year in the league. And I think I signed a four-year deal for, like, I don't know, 800000 900000 mm -hmm. something like that. And they didn't, they didn't have those huge contracts right. they have now. Um, and well, what was your major in college? Buddy? In college, I majored in advertising, and uh, and that's I have a vivid imagination. So uh, you know, any, even now in business, I can always come up with ideas about different things to do. I have a very creative mind. You think a lot of that comes from your reading? Yeah, probably. A lot right. of it does come from reading. And I'm all, you know, and I was into some science fiction stuff, a lot of that. Right. You know, futuristic stuff and so um yeah my mind goes there yeah okay. and so yeah i think of things like that but um i majored in advertising um now if i had to do it over again i, I later on in life i got into a lot of that gym and physical fitness stuff so I, right. if i you know, went back i'd probably change my major to some type of phys ed but um you know whatever you you have an aptitude for or whatever you want to do there's probably a field you can go into mm -hmm. and um, and do well at it. And, you know, that's the thing in life to find out what your passion is, and, and if you can do that for a living, mm -hmm. then that's a good thing. You get to do what you like. It. Yeah, that's a that's a true um, But I, I got drafted by Kansas City. Um, you know, when I got in the NBA. I was I was young, and the NBA wasn't as big as it is now. You know, it was on TV and you were pro athlete and all that. But, you know, you didn't have all this Facebook and Twitter and everything all over the internet. And so, you know, you might go out and get tipsy and nobody would ever know about it. Right, right, right. You know, but now everybody knows everything. Yeah. But we, um, I was just, you know, I was a young guy that had money. And well, was that a culture shock? I mean, how was um, that? Was it just like a... Almost like a, a adrenaline rush uh, coming into not that type of thing. Rush. It was just now, you know, I was able to drive a nice car and, and I bought my mother a house and being able to do things like mm -hmm. that, you know, makes you feel good. But um, you have a lot of free time. And so um, you kind of have to be disciplined in that sense because you only work two, three hours a day. So on a day you have practice, you have a two-hour practice. On a game day you have a one-hour practice and the game takes about two and a half hours. And, you got a lot of free time. Right. And so if you're not disciplined in that sense, or you know, have good willpower, there's so many bad things you can get into. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, even though you hear a lot about pro athletes doing different things, the majority of guys live good lives, they take care of themselves. Just whenever one guy does something, it's so sensationalized right. that you know, it gives the impression that that you know, we're bad people and and you know we're out there wilding out but right. really we're not mm -hmm. but i uh you know i was a young single guy and you know, a lot I of money out. yeah and i hung yeah. out but, you know i didn't drink too much but i did a lot of chasing women right. you know i used to go out every night right. and uh you know i did that from the time i was 21 till i don't know when i got probably in my 30s early 30s and you just you know it gets old um and, and so that's it's a dream that so many young people that i talk to I mean, like yeah. you said, that, that's their but ambition. See, that should be your thing. dream. And so, right. you know, you might you might have a lot of money and do that, but your dream shouldn't be to make money so you can do that. Your dream should be, that should be a byproduct of being successful and making money. Mm -hmm. You know, being a great ball player comes from hard work. You got to put in hours a day of doing that, and which means you got to rest. Um, eat right. Oh, you got to eat right. You got to take care of your body because this, you know, this is your tool. Right. So you got to take care of it and make sure it's always in tip-top shape. Um, and you're not going to do that by drinking all the time, getting high all the time, um, you know, hanging out all the time. It catches up with you. And so um, I did, you know, whenever I think back, I did a lot of my hanging out in the summer. Mm -hmm. But during the season, you know, we have off days. You go out. But I, I remember when I was playing in Kansas City, it was so cold there, man. You didn't want to go out right. too much. But, you know, we'd go out. We'd go out and hang out. Um, 
I'm trying to think. There was this little club down from the arena called Amigos. We would always go there after him. Yeah. Little tight club. Right. But we go in there and just hang out, have us a few drinks. But then, you know, the game is over at 9.30. We usually be home by midnight because right. we had practice the next morning. Right. And our coach didn't play. <laughs> right. He would, you know, we, and they, a lot of coaches, they'll practice early in the morning. Um, now I think coaches have gotten so now they practice late in the day. So now it almost doesn't matter if you hang out because if you practice, you know, 11, 12. So they kind of cater their practices towards Not the so lifestyle much cater, the players. What, what I think they try to do is make it so that because you play at night, there's really no need for you to be up early in the morning. That's why, you know, basketball, we don't have, we never had curfews. They don't have bad checks like football, because football, they play early in the day. Basketball, you don't play till seven at night, so it doesn't matter. If a guy stays out till, say, five in the morning, he doesn't play till seven at night, so he's got all day to rest. But if you do that every day, it catches up with you. And so, um, you know, with basketball, a lot of it is, is self-policed and self-disciplined. So now, you live in that lifestyle, like I said, you had that kind of player lifestyle uh, with the women and things like that. And like you said, a lot of these uh, young, well, young people yeah. look at that and they say, man, that's the pinnacle of life. That's the, that, that, that's yeah, what I'm looking for. But you said you got yeah. played, that, that got played out, and you well, told me played out quick. Well, you know, as I matured, um, you just, you get, you get tired of hanging out every night. Um, you know, meeting when you date for a month. And, or, you know, not that long. Um, and then you start, you know, what really happens is people start gravitating towards you and latching on to you um, to get something off of you, not. Right. And so the really the, the, the dilemma you end up having is people around you, they're around you because they like you or they're around, there, or they're around you so they can get something from you. Right. And most of the time they're around so they can get something from you so they can leech off you. Now, was there a void going on in your life um, at that point? Like, probably, it was like something was I missing? I didn't think so at the time, but there was. And I got, um, I just, I, I, I really just got tired of hanging out all the time. And so I started, I started spending more time at home. And, um, and I got, um, you know, I'm thinking about the back in the 90s. And as, as computers started to come around, and I was really into that stuff, I started gravitating more that way. And um, I had friends that were, you know, I ended up having some geeky friends mm -hmm. that were into that stuff. And I became more of that kind of guy. Right. Um, and I became, I got really heavy into physical fitness and um, going to the gym every day. And once you start doing that stuff, you're not going to be hanging out every night. Because, right. you, you know, we just be at 9 o'clock, you're thinking, I got to be at the gym at 9 tomorrow morning. So, right. you know, I can't really be hanging out too late tonight. And right. you just, you just kind of association brings along similarities, kind of. Yeah, right. And so I, um, you know, at the time I wasn't thinking there was, there was, you know, that this is kind of an empty thing and it, 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 it's not really a great thing and I don't really enjoy this. You just kind of start realizing, you know, I, I did this yesterday. I did this last week. Right. You know, it just gets all the routine. same. You start right. seeing the, the same people that you only see when you go out and. Um, he just, he just outgrew it. I just, right. you know, I mostly just outgrew it. And I started, uh, the friends I had, um, you know, they either weren't the type of people that hung out a lot or they were the same as me and they started, you know, gravitating away from that. And, um, and then I just, and I, I, I kind of, you know, I grew up, when I was a kid, I went to church and I went regularly. And as I grew up, I always, you know, I always knew God. Um, Back in, in the NBA, before games, they always have a um, what they call chapel service, and guys from both teams, whoever wants to, can come, and they come and have a prayer, a prayer, or a little fellowship right before the game. And so I, I'd always done that, and um, and even though I didn't go to church regularly, I knew God and you know, loved Him and all that. I just I'd always said, you know what, I ain't ready to right, be saved. Right. I ain't ready to you be in the church. You want to put in first place. And I just got to a point where um, I have a friend, uh, Bill Nelson, who a uh, very religious cat, um, very strong in his walk with God. And we were really good friends. And you know, Bill, he didn't, he didn't chastise me too much about you know, not being saved and going to church and stuff. He would mention something every now and then, but he wasn't the type of guy that stayed on you about it. But um, just one day he, he said something to me, and it just hit me. You know, it's funny how God works. He just said to me one day, he said, um, you know, and until, you know, the silent until you get saved, um, 
you know, you're not, you're not going to be settled or happy in your life. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, I'm really not, I'm not completely happy in my life. You know, I mean, it's been okay, but I do. I, there was a kind of restlessness and a, and a void, as you say, mm -hmm. and I hadn't really thought about it. And I said, uh, you know what? Maybe it is time for me to, to. You know, get saved and, and give my life to God, and so I didn't do it right away. I started, I started, you know, kind of going to Bible study and kind of looking and reading the Bible more, and I started feeling very comfortable with this is what I want to do, and and I ended up doing it. So last summer, you know, I gave my life to Christ, and I started um, just trying to, you know, lead that life, and I thought it was going to be hard, and I, not because I drink and get high or anything. I thought. Um, I thought it would be, the two things that I thought would be the hardest for me, I thought it would be hard for me to quit cussing because I cussed a lot. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know that. If you're real right, close to right, me, you know right. I, I do. And I thought um, that I wasn't, I thought when I got saved, I wasn't going to date again until I got married. Right. And um, what's happened is I, I've, I've gained much better friendships with women. Mm -hmm. And now instead of looking at a woman and looking at her, physically and lustfully, um, I look more at like the kind of person she is right, and right. and um, what kind of friendship we can have. And mostly, all the women I know now have good friendships with. Um, you know, some of my really close friends are women uh, that are like sisters to me, but... Um, that relationship just, kind of renewed your mind. Yeah, I uh, just, things are good right now. I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy with, with uh, you know, loving the Lord and and going down that path and um, and all, all I pray for is just God to just guide me and tell me what He wants me to do and uh, and go go down the right path and do you know make sure I do the things every day that He wants me to do. But um, you know, I'm happy. Things are good. Mm -hmm. and I like my life. Yeah. And there's just one thing you could say to the youth. You know, I would just in a well, minute, what would you say? To say one thing. I would tell I would I tell kids this. You know, you're into whatever sport you're into. Um, use that sport, and there's so many disciplines in sport that translate to everyday life um, to make you better. But um, never look at the sport as a as a means to gain, um, you know, to gain great notoriety, to hang out fame and um, this great money and all that because that's that stuff should be a byproduct of your hard work yeah yeah everybody wants to have money but you know you want to play you when you go train to be an athlete you want to train to be the best athlete you can you don't want to train to go make money because um, more than likely it's not going to happen and so um, you might as well use that training and that skill, it can still make your life better and translate into something else good. And so you should look at it like that. But, you know, if you like playing sports, um, just work at it as hard as you can. You gotta be dedicated to it. You, know, you gotta put the time in every day. And that's what I mostly tell kids. But I tell them, don't count on being a pro athlete. It could happen, but there's about a 99% chance, even more than that, 99.5% chance it's not gonna happen. You know, for every Kevin Johnson you see, well, for Kevin Johnson, you see there's probably two million kids out there right. that didn't make it. And not to backtrack, but you was telling me about that brush in with the law. Yeah, um, <coughs> so I just, you know, like when, that. I, was, when, I, was, when I was a kid, I was, I was, I was kind of wild. And um, I had, and that was actually one of my teammates. We were, um, I used to do things like I used to steal from stores, that kind of stuff. Um, and we, um, there was this store Ron, you know, as I'm thinking back now as a, a stupid kid, store blocked from my house, and it was a little pony, a pony keg is like one of those little neighborhood mom and pop stores. Right. We call them pony kegs in Cincinnati. And me and one of my friends broke in the store, we broke in the store, we were gonna steal some sodas or something. And of course, you know, police came, we mm -hmm. ran, we got caught, and it's the only time really I ever got caught doing something by the police, but um, I remember I, I had, the, the I think, <laughs> The most sad thing about it was I disappointed my mother. And that right. was the, the thing I worried about. My, I wasn't so much scared of going to jail or any of that. Yeah. It was, you know, the effect what I did have on my mother. But I ended up, I had to go to court. And when I went to court, 
I remember um, I'm there, I was, uh, I think I was 14, and I told the judge, it was a lady judge, and um, you know, they, she asked me, do you have anything to say? And I said, you know, I did this, but if you give me a second chance, I swear I'll never do anything again. And, you know, I gave her one of those speeches. And, mm -hmm. and she, she um, I don't even think she gave me probation. She just, you know, she let me go and she said, I'm gonna be watching you to mm -hmm. see and, and I mean, I ain't gonna say I never broke the law again yeah, after right, that, right, but, right. you know. But it woke me up. I, yeah, it woke yeah, me up, and that, that was one of the things that spurred me and said, you know, instead of doing that, start concentrating on this basketball. And, uh, cause I was playing basketball at that time, but it was just, you know, I just started playing and I wasn't, you know, greatly into it. I wasn't a great player or anything. Mm -hmm. It was just something I did. Mm -hmm. And um, I just started, that was when I started, you know, concentrating on it more, playing more every day. And I started getting better, mm -hmm. and I just continually got better. Right. So since that relationship that you developed with the Lord, you know, how has that changed your perspective in life, you know, towards your goals and everything else? Um, I'm not as much in the world anymore. Um, uh, and I kind of, I kind of been getting to that point anyway, where uh, money didn't doesn't mean as much to me as it did when I was younger. I, you know, I don't feel the need to have a nice car. The only thing you want to do, you want to, you want to be happy and comfortable in your life. You want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and, you know, be happy and or proud of the person you see. And um, you develop more compassion for other people. And I've always kind of been that way, but I know now, you know, I see I have more of that in me. And you know, one of my goals in life is to always, you know, help other people as much as I can. And so. Um, I think that's a byproduct of my relationship with the Lord. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your business now. Okay, uh, I'm always doing about five things. I always tell people I'm a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> right. But I have a, a development and construction company and and we do some telecommunications also. And mostly we just get state and federal contracts and it's just you no know, work. Just, but one of the things that I want to do with this company and it's starting to come together like that. We, we set the company up last year and we're just now starting to get work. But one of the good things that come out of it, there's a lot of underprivileged and disadvantaged kids. We're, and by kids, I mean guys like 20, 25 years old, because I'm 50. Right, right. So a 25 year old is like the kid for me, but we're able to take um, guys like that and we can give them jobs. And right. you know, some of the, some of the, the, um, the minority parts of Sacramento, they have 50, 60 percent unemployment rates. Mm -hmm. Even though the national, I think national is like eight or nine percent. Right. But some of these black parts, these black areas, they have 50, 60 percent unemployment rates. So there are people out there that want to work. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I was looking at a thing on TV last night. They, they, they always interview somebody who doesn't want to work. There are people, people want to work and they want jobs. Right. And we're able to do some of that now and it's a good feeling to be able to you know help somebody give them a job and that's the work of the just lord help, help, helping people yeah. and it seems like you're doing your passion that's my passion yeah being able to being able to help somebody else and hopefully they'll help somebody else they'll carry it on and help somebody else father we just thank you so much there's no name above your name i wouldn't serve any other name yeah sure Mashiach. There's power in the name There's victory in the name There's healing in the name Healing Anointing in the name Yes There is peace in the name If you would speak aloud the name Then every knee shall bow before Every knee
bless your name. Yeshua. We bless your name. that you have tuned in to this song that you are here tonight maybe you know him already 